This is Edwin K. Morris, and you are about to embark on the next Pioneer Knowledge Services Because You Need to Know, a digital resource for you to listen to folks share their experience and knowledge around the field of knowledge management and nonprofit work. This program is being brought to you by the support from ROM Global your number one choice for knowledge management, protecting your business from knowledge-based risks and helping it leverage new opportunities. Good afternoon. Uh, My name's Andrew Trickett. I live in Shifnal in Shropshire in the great country of England. The thing I've learned is to be perpetually curious and dissatisfied with the status quo. I currently work at Arup in the capacity of Global Rail Knowledge and Information Manager. The last book I read was The Age of Unreason by Charles Handy, and it was important because it envisioned the world of work we live in now. And it was the book that when I read it for the first time in 1992, it changed my life. If stranded on an island, my top three must-haves are The Great Gatsby, a full collection of Wisden Almanacs and the collected works of J.S. Bach. The absolute best advice I've received was when receiving a team solution, take a step back and ask, what are we missing here? Nine times out of ten, when we reflect, there's a better solution. That was something that was provided by my late father. All right. Do you want to name your father? Yeah, my father's name was Alex. And um, sadly, he passed away around about a year ago. He and my grandfather were probably two of the biggest influences on my life outside of Charles Handy. Where did Alex get his observation of this? Where did he discover this? He was an engineer. And I think he noticed it via observation. I think what happened was that my father was working in the 60s, 70s, 80s, up to roughly the early 90s. He was always like a questioning manager. He always used to Mm. push people to do better than they Mm. thought they could do. And also, he'd had the advantage. He worked in South Africa. He worked in Iran pre-revolution. He'd done a lot of work in the Middle East. And he came back to England in the mid 1970s and i think he was deeply dissatisfied with the way managers worked Mm. but he also saw lots of mistakes being made because people rushed into a solution so he had his teams always saying what are we missing here Mm. because sometimes the most obvious answer and everyone agreed, oh, yeah, great yeah. answer. And then he said, yeah. hang on, let's just make sure it's the right answer. The step back from action is kind of interesting because we're going to talk about communities of practice today as the focal. But we talked a little bit about the difference between innovation and just being aware of things, networks, people's connections, ideas, concepts. And it sounds like he had this ability And it doesn't sound like it's a fear-based kind of concept where, oh, we better think about, you know, some people do that and then they never make a decision. Mm. But this was intentful to actually do another run-through of analysis just to make sure you didn't miss any uh, or or just assume Mm. things and not really question as deeply. How did that show up in practice, do you think? With my father or with me? Well, let's hear, let's start with dad and then work your way towards the future. I once, sort of many years ago, it was sort of quite popular to take your son to, or daughter to work. Oh, yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. one day he took me to work. I was only about 15 at the time. And he just sort of said, you know, just sit there and just watch. Hmm. And he took me around the shop floor, around, you know, and I sat in on a couple of meetings. And I actually saw it in action. Hmm. What I saw was people going, they had to stop. They had to take that step back Mm. because he wouldn't let them off the hook because if they said, oh, well, there's there's, there's no solution, he said, let's look again. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he would do that two or three times. He used to drive them crazy. (laughs) But but sometimes it's on the third attempt where somebody is politely prodding you. (laughs) you know, Someone was politely prodding you to take that step back yeah he once said to me he said i don't envy your generation he said because 
we worked in an era of memos and and typewriters mm -hmm. nowadays he said your generation has emails and everything else i was showing him things like teams and zoom and he said he didn't like it because he said it le it can lead to the the snap decision yeah. how many times have we sent the email and we read it and we think why did I send it there? You know. Well, there's there's a transactional element that uh, I think your father really captured. I, I want to hang our hat today on this because it's all about community of practice mm. and how they behave. The vision I got when you said about politely prodding, which I, I think I could come up with a few other phrases, but the politely prodding, I, all I could think of is like the chef stirring the pot. Another stir, another stir, another stir. Mm. Not accepting the first solution or you've mm. said that the not not stopping not stopping but actually just really rethink re reframe re reconstitute re relook and see if there's something else and i think you're right i think in the transactional age of digitization it is a fire and forget mode where it's just transactional execute boom 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 there's not a lot of reflection time and processing time to consider deeper knowledge and uh, repercussions. Yeah, I mean, as I say, that was he did. This is not the newest idea. I mean, he was an engineer. Mm. I shared this with him once because I had a book, books by Adam Smith. Mm. It sort of said, innovation derives from the tinkering of the common workmen and the ingenuity of the makers of machines. Mm. And actually, what I think Adam Smith and my dad said i mean i think i'm not quite sure he's in adam smith's league politely but he saw that it was that stirring that how can we make it better because he recognized that there were challenges mm -hmm. but the people who are best equipped to handle those challenges are the people closest to the coal face mm -hmm. if i if you understand the analogy tell me tell me please the analogy is you know miners were at the coal face so they were like that they were right in it yeah it's an yeah. english idiom in the military it would be boots on ground you know uh, you're in yes. the mix you're you you see the reality for what it is that's where the Germans, when they invented things like Blitzkrieg and stuff like that, mm -hmm. they delegated a lot of the decisions to the, the sergeants, the NCOs in the field, because they recognized that the general or the chief staff back in HQ couldn't see what the soldier saw on the ground and could adapt to it. Yeah. So he was a constant tinkerer and he was with people who were constant tinkerers there was a an old friend of his who tinkered with speedboat engines and he mm. said so my dad said well what do you do he said i race them a little mm -hmm. now that's a bit like saying to mozart what do you do and i dabble in a few concertos <laughs> yeah. he actually held the tinkerer actually held sorry water speed records in a particular class the most unassuming man you would have ever have met but right, because right. he kept tinkering he kept advancing his speed it's a level of creativity now we're talking about the creative juices around how performance perfection advancement making things better or faster in that case and constantly seeking is this just let's throw it back to where i think it started the socratic method of just deep inquiry deep inquiry asking different questions trying to reframe to get towards a better solution i think also it's a distrust of the word perfection ah. you use the word perfection there's a great video it's called jiro dreams of sushi and <laughs> and this is a guy who runs a small sushi bar under a tokyo railway station when uh, President Obama went to Japan, literally the Prime Minister at the time took him to this place as a good picture of him with President Obama. This guy has been making sushi all his life. Oh, okay. They said, you know, have you ever made the perfect sushi? He said, no, I've been doing this. I'm still learning my craft. And actually, that's a good way to do it in any profession is be distrustful of perfection mm. because if you think you're perfect there's only one way after that yeah there's what's called the s curve in mm. innovation and it's the same for businesses it's the same for anything the best way is you know if you think of it as a normal curve you're going up the curve and then you reach a slight plateau and then the innovation 
dips. The best time to be looking for the next thing, a bit like Wayne Gretzky said, you know, I skate where the puck is going to be. So you start to re-innovate just before you get to the top of that S-curve. The trick, of course, is knowing that you are at the top of that S-curve. That's where the communities of practice can help because they can give you the feedback from what they're seeing. There is an overlap and there has to be an overlap between the day-to-day project work that you're doing, the community of practice and your external networks. Harold Jarchi does that a really good one of that because the external networks, the work that you're doing, that's, that's being at the coalface. The external network is, oh, I heard this interesting, interesting concept the other day. You know, somebody was talking about, you know, chat GPT or AI or how they were doing something. And I thought to myself, you know, with a bit of tweaking, you could do that. The community of practice can act as the incubator for that. Let's set the stage and define for us what community of practice means at your level. In the Arab level, I think it's quite simple. It's our ability to collaborate across the firm for our members, as we call them. We don't call ourselves employees to develop some strategies, change the way that we do things to research, you know, look at industry best practice, learning tools, becoming an influencer on in our industries as well. But also, and this is where I come in primarily, is bringing our knowledge together in one place. Yeah, you know, that to me is a community of practice. We call them skills networks. Uh, let me just ask because I've heard a similar framework, but in the the other instance I'm thinking of, and I I can't quote the name, but of the company, but there was a big discussion about making that participation mandatory. There's kind of a trade off, isn't there? If if you make something mandatory and say you will participate in this community of practice, or do you make it a a optional opt in kind of concept? <laughs> I think I could have asked you to put me on mute while I screamed down the microphone when you said it's mandatory. <laughs> it's, it, to me, it's like having the you know the mandatory group song before you start off on an, or the mandatory icebreaker at the stop. You know that everyone everyone loathes with a passion. Yeah, <laughs> you know Dave Snowden, you've heard you know says you can't co-opt knowledge, you can't conscript it. I think that just doesn't sound clever, but what you can do is you can, you know, you can encourage people through the norms of the organization. Yeah. In the mandatory framework, it's the writing crop of the good culture, you know, Mm. Hey, you will participate and you bring them dragging and crying to the table and it's not the best product. You're not going to get the best quality out of that but if you have an organization i'll i'll venture to say that has that framework of you will participate then it it may need a little tweaking it may need a little work i would say a lot of work because what <laughs> because what you'll get is you will get presenteeism i i was at the compulsory away day did you contribute i think well no i just had to no. be there you know? yeah yeah. Okay. So you bring them by invitation, right? Mm-mm. And then does the organization provide resources in the effect that, uh, you know, if it's not mandatory, but you also want to grease the skids, so to speak, mm. to make sure that there's no punishment if you're spending time reflecting or sharing or producing extra knowledge that isn't really part of your day job. I would would hesitate to use the word in Arab that there's a punishment. I don't think there is. I think there's a different issue. And it's the same as we talked about doing the lessons learned. It's the same with time, is people are working on very busy projects. They may want to, but the problem is, is that just time doesn't allow them to. And this gets me back to one of the areas where we talked about the use of AI, Microsoft Copilot, call it what it is. It has the potential to liberate the creative knowledge worker from the mundane, which should hopefully free up the time for them to be creative or to get involved in their thing. The danger 
is that you'll get the equivalent of what's called Parkinson's law, is that work expands to fill the day. Mm. And what it means is that, that managers sort of load more on because they think they need to fill the day. I think the important thing is companies need to recognize that communities can be one of the key drivers of innovation, you know, because Joseph Schumpeter once said, innovation offers the carrot of spectacular reward, but also it's the stick of destitution. Because if your company is not constantly evolving, adjusting, innovating, how long is it going to be here? And communities of practice, because of that, the triple overlap are the ones that could really help with them. I think the other bit is that you have to recognize that sometimes ideas are transitory. My wife, many Christmases ago, bought me a really a nice little brass figurine, and it's a picture of a feather and a butterfly just landing on it. Mm. That's where the communities come in, is to take that butterfly and make it stick on the feather. One of the things we're looking at is doing what I call little bets or curiosity funding. And that is, I've got this idea. I just want to start figuring it out. Mm -hmm. I need a thousand pounds just to do it. It's still early days. I've sort of said that the community leaders should have control over it because they are the closest mm -hmm. to the coal face. It's no doubt something we'll adapt. Oh, yeah. Because you don't want to lose the impetus by making it overly bureaucratic. Yep. You want... I've got this idea, it's in, it's improved within a day or a week, I can get on with it. But if, and it comes down to trust, trust, you know, trust is everything because you've got to trust that the people will use that a thousand pounds responsibly. I want to define what innovate means. Merriam-Webster defines innovate as to make changes, do something in a new way. To me, that kind of deflates what I think most people hang their hat on what innovation is, because as we've talked about it, sometimes gets kind of imaged that it's the eureka, oh my gosh, this is going to change everything, like it's some big once over superhero kind of event, mm. but it's just all those little subtleties and we, as we talked about, in the community of practice, all you're doing is giving new pathways of communicating, transferring knowledge, transferring and building concepts in order to have kind of a, a very unauthoritarian lessons learned best practices beehive of activity. But as you said, if, if that trust is not there, that you're giving stewardship and agency to your people then that cannot exist well. I think also people have to see that innovation is part of is part of their job. Ooh. And yeah. I think innovation is a bit of a child of freedom. I think you have to have the freedom to be able to express ideas. The community is the safe place, but also to challenge the status quo. Mm. Bobby Kennedy used to say, ask why not? Mm. The community of practice can be a safe space, but it also has to be a safe space for the pearl to grow. If you know how an oyster pearl grows, it's the grit. You need to have frank discussions. It's all, all very well going around saying, you know, mm -hmm. here's my idea and everyone going kumbaya and, and et cetera, et cetera. It needs the grit. It needs the people to say, yeah. going back to my father, what are we missing here? Have you thought of this? Here's my experience of doing this. Here's my experience. Mm -hmm. We tried that. It didn't quite work, but it sounds like the community has got to give people the courage to speak up, mm -hmm. but it's also got to give the people the ability to, to make mistakes. You know, it, it could be, as we said earlier, it could be about these layers. This could just be another layer that somebody's going to pick up in four or five years' time and deliver exactly. on. Exactly. But also to allow them to fail and just say, you know, you know, there's the old joke about Edson, you know, with the light bulb. I found 9,999 <laughs> yeah. ways to fail. But in that, how do you sell that concept as a return on investment to the big corporate piggy bank? to say that's a wise decision. I think to me, you can't have the mandatory idea. Mm. You're not, it's sort of, um, there was an old cartoon, I think in the New Yorker where it sort of shows their sales sort of bumping along the bottom. And then 
pings like that and then goes down again. And they're saying, we want you to have one of those crackpot ideas like you did there. <laughs> you know, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> for a knowledge worker, it's it goes do 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 flash of inspiration do 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 do. It it needs to be incubated. I I get what you're saying, but Andrew, how do you sit down with the CFO and explain that? How about survival? <laughs> But also, it's a selling point to retain your staff. Mm. This is my mm. view, is if you say to somebody, you're going to come in and work, you're going to draft a few memos, and you're going to go home at night. <laughs> you know, Arab says, we shape a better world. That's our strap line. Yeah. Now, that excites. Yeah. You know, communities of practice has never really been a name I've liked. But if you say, would you like to join my community of discovery and exploration or code? Yeah. Or, or code? Oh, uh, you know, pleased, oh. pleased to be invited. Oh, you that's, know. Yeah. that sounds exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That, right. that, yeah. That gets you up in the morning. You know, nobody comes to work to draft memos. Well, you're talking about a cultural foundation, and I want to bring this back to what you said is that Innovate should be part of the worker's job description. Mm. How do you get that concept? Because I, I've pushed that same philosophy on knowledge responsibilities. I, I feel that everybody has a knowledge responsibility in the organization. So therefore, all their job descriptions should have, at least have a paragraph that says what they're responsible to do with their knowledge. So I like the idea that you've got an element of ex expectation of behaviors mm. set in the, around innovation. Your job is to create. Your job is to be alert and mm. ask questions and all those sorts of things yeah. and be inquisitive to make something better. Mm. Yeah, it is. And I think it's, you know, Arab has that strap line to shape a better world. But we get engineers who buy into that. They also, to be fair, mm. because we're not a, a quoted company, we don't have the tyranny of the quarter. We're willing to invest in experiments. If they don't work. Well, OK. What have we learned from this? At least we finance them. The flip side of that is, yes, you have to deliver projects. The problem is, is you can start to innovate at the start of a project. Sometimes there are longer trends that you need to look at. Now, we're fortunate. We've got a great team in our firm. They're called the Foresight Team. And they're the guys and gals who look over the horizon. You know, they're our futurists. But actually, my view has always been is that communities of practice are also futurists. They should be looking over the horizon and saying mm. to people, mm. we've always made tracks this way. What would happen if we made them out of paper? There's a there's a, a thing on a community. I think it can't just go around doing blue sky thinking. It has to turn ideas into action. It has to foster dialogue. But it has to foster dialogue in the sense that it's safe to disagree. I do have a concern, but also you have to have an innate curiosity. It has part of your DNA. Let's talk about all those elements that make a successful journey and experience gaining culture. Once upon a time, you told me about an idea called Shakunin. Shakunin? Shakunin, yes. Shakunin. Can we yeah. talk a little? Does that fit in here? It does, yes, because it it takes us circuitously back to the Jiro <laughs> makes sushi one. <laughs> Perfect. A shokunin is somebody who is a mass. It's a Japanese phrase, and I'm probably mangling it badly about a person who is a master of their craft. It could be a carpenter. It could be a sushi maker. It could be a guy who's working on the master line and just knows by feel mm. that the paint job isn't right. But they've put a lot of work into it. Shokunin, the mastery of one's profession. Dedicating yourself to your art. Mm. And this mm. is something that actually goes back ages. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Freemasons in, in Europe. Craftsman spirit. No work is small. That's what I mean by shocking in. Elevate your craft. Yeah. Well, there here again, it's not in a selfish sense. So what I get from this is that I think in the capitalistic mindset, it is all about me. And in this mindset, it is ultimately community-based. You increase your professional craftsmanship to elevate and help your community. And through your community as well. That's how I 
read it because I'll just go through this and we'll go back in. I think it is, is, you know, my father, although he didn't know the concept, he said, can I do it better? He was constantly challenging his team to raise the bar. That is really just a pure sign of good leadership, <laughs> right? It should be. It should be. What's the name for that? Uh, servant leadership. Yeah. It's, it's bringing everybody together. Yeah. Okay. The full one is Shokunin Kishitsu, which it comes mm. across as the craftsman spirit, the artisan spirit. And I think it's broken down into three key components. There's a taking a pride in what you do. No work is too small. It's like the man JFK allegedly met in Houston and he asked him what he was doing and he was sweeping the floor. He says, I'm helping putting a man on the moon. <laughs> it's doing it with full dedication and concentration. That's more difficult nowadays. It may be for a craftsman that it's mm. not difficult, but in a modern workplace, there are lots of distractions. But if you're using things like focus times or the Pomodoro method, you can do it. There is the ability to elevate your craft. It's, you know, going back to what my father said, he was always challenging his teams. Can you do this better? He was always encouraging them to raise the bar. Mm -hmm. It's not massive steps. It's just steady refining of your thing. You know, if you think about how anybody, you start off as a young apprentice, you know, you just joined a firm for the first time. You need to be molded and changed as you go along. But you have to have that concept in your mind that you're going to look to improve your work. And then pursue the benefit of community through your craft. So how do you do what you do so that everybody benefits? And I think it's not just a case of, you know, what you can do for the community. It's also what the community can do for you. It can bring you new ideas, new concepts that help you achieve the craft elevation. Could we lift and shift this, what you just explained in this concept to say this is also what we mean by knowledge management? Absolutely. My view is if you aren't learning and applying the lessons and they can come via the community or via sitting in a lessons learned meeting. And even if you take away just one concept and say, you know what, I think I can use that. Or you can be innovative as well and say, right, well, if I tweak that just that little tiny bit, it would really work on that project. And going back, this is where I think, you know, things like chat GPT can help us because they can help us make connections that we can't make. But remember, it's only what a machine is telling you. It can't make all the joyous human connections yet. You know, creativity is going to be the key thing for any knowledge profession, because if it can be automated, you have a problem. You're also bringing up the concept of the asking deeper question. With the AI and this elevation of being able to rethink it, uh, it, it's like a digital sounding board to represent all those people around the table to help you either reframe it, deeper thinking, question what you think you know, and all those assumptions that go with it. Mm. Going back, it's also looking outside of your initial network. Ah. There's always been a danger with communities of practice. I've always said it's like this. What do they of baseball know that only baseball know? And what it means is if you just look through the prism of a rail community or a track community, your thinking becomes slightly siloed. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage people to link in to other networks. And I said at the other side, Actually, let's not look for a completely convergent community. Let's look for something completely different. So we've got 58 skills networks in Arab. Rather than looking for something that's very light rail, why don't we go and have a look and see what the maritime team are doing? It brings that new thing. In biology, wouldn't that just be called cross-pollination? Absolutely, yeah. Going back to your butterfly vase uh, mm. sculpture, I mean, you're just lightly touching different pieces just to see if there's something there. Because there's always something that somebody's working on that you think, I could use that. Or a very, if you listen to like classical music, you know, what are variations on a theme? It started off from one thing, but through 
a mixture of art and science and everything else, it became even better. I think the skill set that's required for everything we've just talked about is the spark of creativity. Because everything we've talked about is a... It depends on the receiver, the human framework, to be open and aware and cognitive of what they're seeing, hearing, learning, you know, observing, to say, hmm, and think about that, you know, to see if there's a mm. fit, to understand consequences and what ifs and all the scenarios that require a visionary mentality. Now, you said art, and I want to bring that around here is that. What I think a lot of folks that I have conversations with is that they're stuck with the science side of knowledge mm. management in the f process and technology piece. But as long as the human element is there, then we need to put as much weight or equal amounts of the art side of it in understanding that the human framework and the psychology behind cognition, uh, inception, and being able to understand, comprehend, and have a deeper understanding takes a lot of work, and it's not just one thing. And also, in some respects, it can be a difficult sell. There's a, a, a lady called Stephanie Barnes who talks about radical KM, and there are people who bring Lego into mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for managers, that's just to jump too far. Yeah. I pay these yeah. people to work, not to do Lego. Exactly. Right. Because there's a misconception that play is not work yeah, or can have value mm. to work. Going back to the Bottegas we talked about, so there's um, a good article by a guy called Piero Formica came out of 2016, but he talks about Renaissance paintings and he talks about the Vitruvian Man painted by Leonardo da Vinci, which he says... It was the technology and the art. If you know, look at some of Leonardo's pictures for a tank or for a submarine. They were bringing, mm. they were reimagining mm. the technology of the day, and then he was able to bring it forward. I think the other thing is you have to defend your idea. But I think going back to that butterfly, you also have to remember that people, it can be fragile things, so you have to be careful about your mm. criticism you don't mm -hmm. want to put the person off from thinking god mm -hmm. that was such a terrible experience i'll never have another idea again it's got to be i would say almost not controversial but also compassionate mm. you know it's it's like public speaking somebody's putting themselves out on the limb to come and speak you may think their ideas are the worst things yeah. since sliced bread but for them it's important in that respect you don't want to be the heckler you don't want to constitute that hecklers are okay in this organization, meaning you're just sitting back and mm. throwing eggs at people with no value to add. Yeah. As a container of community building, I think it's a missed opportunity that most organizations that I've seen that try to go down the road of having community be safe is there's no sheriff. They don't establish a sheriff to be able to say, whoa, whoa, that behavior is not acceptable. You know, let's go back to what Benjamin Franklin, we talked about this early on, the the think tank, if you will. The Junto group. Yeah, the Junto. They had a prescription. Mm. They had an agreements list. They had things that the container, and I keep using container because it's just a frame, frame that I like, because it contains the group. And it's a group agreement. It's a group behavior. And it's a group agreement that they all will adhere to but there's somebody who's got to keep that in check. In, in, in an organization that does not have a policing, and I, I'm using that word mm. vaguely, but the sheriff to say, sit down, you're, you're out of order, you know, that sort of thing, then there's no trust or safety in the agreements. If no, if no one obeys the law, then why do But I mean, like, like most communities develop their own charters. Okay. And I think... It does come down to more senior people, people who've been in the organization. It doesn't have to be somebody with a managerial rank, mm. but it's just somebody to say, that wasn't helpful. <laughs> I mean, I've seen it done some other places where if you're going to criticize an idea, have two positives. Yeah. You know, we talked about it with, with lessons learned when we talked last time is you don't give them the the sandwich i won't i won't use the phrase you don't you, do, you, you don't give them that yeah. but you say i really like this i really like this but but you don't and you don't do the but and you say oh. however ah. however ah. 
However, I think this idea needs a little more clarification. Or in this area, you don't use the word mistake. Mm -hmm. What were the areas for improvement? Mm -hmm. And that's where the community can help because you've done it, you've tested it out in the community. When I did my MBA more years than I care <laughs> to remember, the tutor said, you know what the advantage of an MBA is? Some wise person said, yeah, we're paying you £15,000 to hear this he said no <laughs> no he said he said you're able to test out ideas without crushing the company and it's the same with the community it's the ability to test out an idea in what is by and large a safe area mm -hmm. by and large is a safe area it depends on the culture of your organization but in arab i'd like to think it is a safe area yeah. but people are scared because it's you're suddenly putting your head above the parapet and I think a community has to be that almost put their arms around you and say, mm -hmm. don't it's worry, okay. Chip. Yeah. Don't it's worry, okay. Mary. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not, we're not going to flame you. Yeah. That's a welcome feeling in the recent decade of a lot of flaming going on in a lot of different ways. Before we wrap up, Andrew, I, I want to give you the mic and say, is there any bits of wisdom you would like to leave the listeners <sighs> with? any bits of wisdom. I think I go back to what I said at the start, to be perpetually curious. But also, I think, you know, to be nice to people with ideas. Mm -hmm. Sadly, I don't have any children. I've got a grandson who I adore, but I don't have any children of my own. Ideas are like people's children. You know, you wouldn't go and beat up a fellow member's kid don't beat up on their idea. Mm. Be supportive, but also look for the, what is that person missing? Because going back with an idea, mm. sometimes you can be so close to the idea. You haven't done that, what we said at the start. Take a step back, reconsider, come back and just talk about that one. There's something there. A little polish, you know, just to go back to your oyster. It just needs a little more polishing before it's ready. But don't make it like Gatsby's green light that nobody ever gets there. You'll never get perfection. Mm. Uh, but I'd rather have 80% mm. out, you know, 80 out there because we can work on the other 20. The image I got, how to be kinder to your, <laughs> your, your colleagues' children. All I could think of was like... If I could reframe how people bring ideas, let's say in a meeting, and if I can stop myself from reacting and analyzing and just consider that they're bringing me an egg, a chicken egg, mm. an ostrich egg, some egg, and the egg is fragile, but it's got a lot of potential. Mm. And it's my job, if I'm leading the organization or the, or the meeting or what have you, is to carefully accept that egg and put it on a shelf and let's let's talk about it instead of reacting sometimes i get reactive i, I don't know if you, you may not know that but if there's something that sounds like there's a challenge in the air yeah that gets my gruff up a mm -hmm. little bit so i like this idea of coming with it in an empathetical and a very methodical slow boil kind of way mm. that allows it to exist without and I'll say it, judgment. There was a, I don't know if I've told this story before. I worked in a Japanese firm based in the UK. I learned quite a lot about them, as you might have guessed. But one was always stuck with me, was that we were in a meeting and all the junior managers were putting ideas forward, you know, how they were going to deal with this issue with tyres. And the senior people were all sitting around the room. They were sitting on the outside ring. And after about 45 minutes of this, senior man put his hand up, room goes quiet. And it was just the way the translator got it because a lot of them were talking, he was doing English to Japanese and vice versa. So the gentleman spoke, everybody listened and the translator came and said, I have divined the will of the meeting. This is how we're going to go forward. Wow. And sometimes with innovation, as a senior person, it's maybe listening to the ideas and saying, right, I've divined the will of the meeting. Here's some good points. Here's some points that have to go away and work on. 
what time do you need? Blah, blah, blah. Hmm. It's it's always stayed with me Yeah, 20 years after I heard it for the first time. It builds the expectation that, one, the junior folks have an open playpen to work in without interference. Mm. Uh, so that gives this energy and creativity perfect habitat to flow in. So on the outside, senior management absorbs, listens, reflects, processes, mm. and then ta-da, they pick the, the point to interject instead of being involved and in trying to drive the conversation. Yeah. As I say, it always surprised me because you always hear of Japanese firms being quite hierarchical in that respect. I think it was hierarchical uh, in the sense that mm, the mm. senior people were there to make a decision. But I, it always got me thinking, what would happen if we did it in a, a Western environment? To put it in recent terms, it's a crowd surfing method of of gaining perspective. It's just a crowd mm. surf. It's it's being able to listen to your demographic and try to understand. And also to be humble enough to know that you don't know everything. <laughs> well, that might be the issue with the Western it, philosophies then. <laughs> I, I was going to say it is it is an issue, but also with, I'm going to say with, with men, yeah. but that's fine. I know best. I, I'm the cowboy of this operation. Uh, and your cat will remind you in a few moments that actually you you have no control. <laughs> uh, on that uh, high note, Andrew, thank you for your time and participation and sharing your deeper understanding with us. Thank you, Edwin. Really glad to do this, and uh, thank you very much. This program is being brought to you by the support from ROM Global, your number one choice for knowledge management, protecting your business from knowledge-based risks and helping it leverage new opportunities. You have just finished our latest Because You Need to Know, a public service of Pioneer Knowledge Services. Please join us on LinkedIn and find us at pioneer-ks.org.